I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Ronald Kraus. Dr. Kraus is a physician and a medical researcher. He's professor of pediatrics and medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and his research focuses a lot on plasma lipoproteins and related traits that influence cardiovascular health and disease. So he thinks a lot about diet and nutrition, the effects of diet and lifestyle on cardiovascular health, things like dietary fats, so saturated versus unsaturated fats, carbohydrates, how all of these things influence our physiology and our health. So things like blood lipid levels, cholesterol levels, cardiovascular disease risk. And we talked about a lot of topics in this realm. We discussed how some of the major ideas that influenced uh, dietary guidelines lines came about and evolved over the past several decades. We talked about the so-called diet heart hypothesis, which is an influential hypothesis that was formulated many decades ago that basically said, uh, you know, saturated fat was linked to cardiovascular disease. And so that led to the guidelines that said you should reduce saturated fat intake, increase carbohydrate intake. We talked about the process by which these guidelines are actually set and why Dr. Krauss uh, doesn't think the current dietary guidelines around fats is actually a good reflection of what the literature actually states. And, you know, we got into a discussion of of a lot of the relevant science here. So what is the relationship between dietary saturated fat, dietary cholesterol intake, and HDL and LDL cholesterol levels? Um, How does diet, including fat levels and carbohydrate intake, how do those things actually affect um, our health and our disease risk? We talked about the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats, um, some about how they work in the body, how different types of dietary patterns influence things related to cardiovascular health. So if you're interested in diet and nutrition, in particular how they relate to things like cardiovascular and metabolic health, things like saturated fat and cholesterol, this is a really good episode. Um, We covered a lot of ground. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation conversation with Dr. Ronald Kraus. To start off with and get us talking about some of this stuff is, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Well, um, I do have uh, half a, a, a maybe a, a, an ounce or less of orange juice to get started. Then I have a uh, cereal, uh, which is a, a it's called fiber one. It, it's it's pure fiber with no sugar, and I put fruit on it um, and some nuts. I have a mix of fruits: uh, blackberry, blueberry, strawberry, and raspberry. So it's a colorful mix of fruits. Uh, I sprinkle uh, some um, cinnamon on it. Uh, have some milk, um, which is by the way not full fat milk. Um, and um, coffee and half a bagel uh, with a bit of butter. And is that is that something you've always eaten, or is that is that how intentional is that breakfast given uh, who you are and what you study? It's totally intentional, and um, uh, I, I do this breakfast uh, three times, usually three times a week, alternating with breakfast where I have a, a single egg 
um, with uh, with bacon. Oh, I also have you know melon. Uh, you know, as part of my food quota. So no, I uh, I, I do the, the cereal and the fruits intentionally. Oh, and banana. I forgot about. <laughs> I had a banana. So I, it's really a, uh, a mix of everything I know how to use um, uh, that might have some nutritional and health benefits, um, and that's how I drive my breakfast. And so why is that your breakfast? What are some of the key, what, what's sort of the macronutrient profile there that okay. you're aiming for? Well, I, I don't, uh, well, let me just say at the outset, I don't, I don't really try to hit a specific set of numbers. I'm, 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 although I'm number oriented and you know, very data centric in my research, um, I don't feel that um, using percent distribution of calories for the macronutrients is all that helpful. I just think it should, uh, we should be thinking about food uh, composition over overall dietary patterns. And what, what has been shown is that once you've picked the right foods and the right dietary patterns, the uh, macronutrient distribution takes care of itself. Mm. Um, you, don't have, you don't start there. You can end there if you want. <laughs> uh, but where I start is uh, getting to your question. Um, with the with the fiber cereal because i think we we in general don't get enough true fiber and there's a real issue which we may talk about perhaps today um regarding uh, the types of carbohydrate and whether carbohydrate is good bad or indifferent um, and that depends a lot on the way the carbohydrates are prepared so i choose the cereal and i'm not i'm not i don't have a uh, disclosure here. I just uh, found that this uh, this particular brand, Fiber One, has a very high quota of true fiber, unprocessed carbohydrate, um, and no sugar. Uh, so that forms the core. <laughs> and on that, I just, as I was saying, I, I just uh, take all the, the plant-based um, nutrients that I can acquire, you know, the phytochemicals that we get from these variety of fruits, um, uh, and include that just as a basic uh, component of a of a healthful diet, which uh, we, again, don't most people don't get enough fruits and vegetables. So I really focus very heavily um, on on those aspects, and it extends into dinner as well, where I uh, I usually have several different vegetables at once, and uh, and and occasionally some fruits. So so that's really the driving force is both. Um, Choosing carbohydrate because I do like carbohydrate, but I want to be careful in the type of carbohydrate I eat. I, so I'm, I'm I've been very much involved with um, reducing carbs in the overall diet as uh, uh, a means of improving metabolic health, particularly for individuals who uh, may be at risk for heart disease and diabetes. Um, but um, uh, carbohydrates from the right sources um, can contain the nutrients as well as fiber, and so that's something I'm very uh, I'm focused on as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And when we think about carbohydrates, you know, one thing people talk about is just overall amount of carbohydrates someone consumes, but mm -hmm. there's different types of carbohydrates. What are some of the major different types of carbohydrates that are out uh, there? Well, carbohydrate, uh, as with many of our other nutrients, uh, are, are, are ex can be extremely complex uh, chemically um, with many, many different forms. Um, that uh, arise from different sources. Um, but the major categories that I think about to try to sort of simplify that, um, start unprocessed uh, carbohydrates at the top of the uh, list of priorities, um, where there has been no grinding up of the external um, capsule. Um, and uh, they're usually dark rather than light. Um, and um, uh, that, that source of fiber has been shown to have health benefits both in the GI tract and perhaps in metabolic conditions as well. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of that is called also called insoluble fiber uh, because there's a second category of uh, carbohydrate uh, foods with fiber that is soluble. Um, so soluble carbohydrate is a second category. Soluble fiber is a second category. Um, and that comes uh, from foods such as oatmeal, which I, by the way, eat uh, periodically, uh, substituting it for the fiber cereal. Uh, and um, uh, it can be taken even as supplements. I use some, some patients who have cholesterol problems. Soluble fiber has been shown to reduce cholesterol. So that's a, and that's found, as, a, as I mentioned, in oatmeal, but there's, there's other sources as well. It's uh, commercially available in a form called psyllium. Um, then one moves from those two categories of healthy carbohydrates to ones that get progressively more problematic and 
uh, and, and at least potentially problematic as as the carbohydrates get processed um, uh, to remove the uh, the outer um, shell, the, uh, the the capsule where a lot of the fiber is contained, um, and you then get white white starches, um, you know, white rice, uh, um, uh, pastas, uh, uh, potatoes. Again, the ones that are white uh, have been more processed, um, and they tend to have effects that can aggravate metabolic traits that we're concerned about and um, you know, they're not unhealthy but they just don't have the best properties to them um, and then one moves uh, to and I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible sort of the bottom of the list are uh, carbohydrates that are simple sugars which mm -hmm. um, are a completely uh, different category but are considered as part of carbohydrate intake because they're contained both within foods that we select even from some of the healthy foods, um, but also have, um, oh, I should, <laughs> I, I should mention, I also eat, uh, eat low-fat low yogurt. I forgot to mention that. That's part of my breakfast as well, um, which has uh, 80 calories per serving uh, and some fruit, um, but um, very little sugar because uh, a lot of the yogurts, uh, for example, do have added sugar, and there's many foods that are out there, both uh, packaged and unpackaged, that um, contain sugar and amounts that can be quite uh, detrimental to metabolic health and so added sugar is definitely at the bottom of the list uh, and there's all kinds of complexity in between but those are kind of the, the spectrum of carbohydrates i think mm -hmm. generally you think about mm -hmm. what about so there's a lot obviously there's a lot of added sugar out there in our food environment but what about like natural so when we think about fruit for example right. fruit often has a lot of sugar naturally um are some fruits higher in sugar how's how's that sugar that yeah. sucrose different yeah. from other forms well the answer is yes uh there uh, uh, fruits uh, differ in the sugar content i'm not a food scientist so i don't have those numbers at the tip of my tongue but um it's very easy to uh, assess that just by the taste the, mm. the sweeter the fruit uh, the more the sugar that's that's the, it's, it comes from fructose glucose, glucose which is another a simple carbohydrate does not have the sweet taste that fructose has so we're dealing with fructose which is a special uh form of, uh of uh, simple sugar um that is found uh, both in fruits it's found in uh in, in foods that have added sugars because it's part of sucrose which is the thing we usually use to sweeten things uh that's a molecule that has both glucose and fructose um but it's the fructose that has the metabolic uh main metabolic effects at least in the things that uh, uh are most closely connected with um uh, uh excess uh, adiposity uh metabolic conditions that can increase heart disease risk um can be uh aggravated by by fructose so in, within fruit however uh, not only is there variation in the fructose content um but unprocessed fruit that is when you haven't ground it up uh, and made juice out of it um will contain that that fructose and 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 the sugar is in a form that's attached uh to uh, usually forms of fiber uh so it's the context in which the food case is consumed that can uh, attenuate the metabolic impact of the sugar by slowing down its absorption maybe even reducing its absorption to some extent um because when one takes a slug of uh, pure sugar um in its in its isolated form or an added sugar such as uh, sodas um you, you can get a really a, a big spike in glucose which stresses the insulin machinery and can ultimately promote um changes in the ability to handle that sugar as the uh, insulin capacity begins to be stretched too far um so within fruit one as i mentioned does not get that uh that, that slug usually if you're not if you're not using a, a, high, a processed if you're using a, mm -hmm. a real so i mean again i just take this on the basis of taste i'm oranges which i which is my one uh, concession to sugar uh, uh is, is you know, a little bit of juice does have sugar and, and that's something one doesn't want to overdo um but within its uh natural form within the orange itself um that uh, not only is there less sugar because one generally does not eat as much uh, sugar coming from the natural fruit as one does from the juice so it's a it's a better way to consume fruit um and then when it goes down the list as fruits get less uh, sweet um it's because they have less sugar mm -hmm. uh, 
and within even a category. I mean, again, this is just a personal experience. You can buy different forms of apples. I mean, there's mm. a huge heterogeneity in the food supply. You can mm-hmm. get some apples that are sweeter than others. Um, and it, it, it's very hard to get this inf- information from um, any kind of inventory. The USDA keeps a list of composition of foods, which one can get lost in a um, huge uh, database. Um, but even um, at, with that information, you don't know for sure when you're buying your fruit, which I do myself. I go shopping for my own food and I can only tell um you know, in the case of sugar, for example, um, what is sweeter than others. And as, as I said, uh, e- even a range of different apples and uh, over time, even they, that can vary. So it's a, it's nutrition is a very difficult thing to actually get into um, that level of quantitative data uh, because um, so much depends on uh, where the, where the food is coming from, how it's processed, uh, even the time of year. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons that nutrition science is so challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously, I mean, this is an inherently complicated subject because there's just so many facts known and unknown out there, uh, that have to do with nutrition and, and how our bodies respond to it. One of the things I want to do in this discussion is give people a sense for how ideas and guidelines get set and how they've evolved over time. And I thought we could start with Uh, going back to the mid 1900s. And there was this thing called the diet heart hypothesis that was formulated and became highly influential. Can you just briefly summarize what that was and sort of how it came about for people? Okay. Well, that's something uh, I've been deeply involved with both personally and historically, although I didn't get involved in the field until a couple of decades later. Um, I inherited a lot of that early information and um, evolved my own work from it, as well as my recommendations that I've uh, promoted uh, for dietary uh, guidelines. Um, But uh, it starts really even earlier than the 1950s when it was shown in the early 1900s that uh, cholesterol um, can uh, form plaques in the arteries and lead to heart disease. And so so, so blood cholesterol was was recognized uh, as a risk factor for heart disease early on. Um, but uh, what happened in the in the in the forties and fifties, um, and I think the diet heart hypothesis you're referring to um, relates to the work of people like Ansel Keys, um, who did studies uh, showing uh, quite properly actually that high intake of saturated fats in the diet increases blood cholesterol levels and particularly the low density lipoprotein or LDL bad cholesterol. Um, and uh, connected the dots, both in terms of um, the relationship of uh, dietary saturated fat intake to cholesterol levels, uh, and also uh, to uh, ultimately to heart disease risk. That was not just his work. In fact, it was over time a, a series of observations that made those made those connections, which um, have been challenged, including from work that I've done um, as being uh, perhaps um, misleading. Uh, in terms of the causal relationship of saturated fat to heart disease. But that was really the basis for the um, uh, designation of the, the diet heart hypothesis, really focused on saturated fat. But but, er, but early on, there was even um, uh, what in retrospect was a real error um, in um, considering total fat as the equivalent of saturated fat. So that the uh, the guidelines early on were focused on limiting total fat intake um, with the secondary objective, the hidden objective in a way, of, of limiting saturated fat and lowering cholesterol. But it was in the context of overall low-fat diets, which also then uh, carried with it um, a shift uh, from fat content. This gets into the macronutrient composition. If you're dropping one thing, you're going to increase something else unless you're reducing total calories. Um, and the increase was in carbohydrates, which was um, really the wrong direction to go. Um, but um, to your question, um, that relationship between saturated fat, cholesterol, and heart disease uh, has formed the basis for dietary guidelines uh, over the years. Um, uh, the McGovern uh, Commission, which uh, started off the whole uh, USDA uh, HHS um, dietary guidelines process, which happens every five years, um, originated um, 
with the McGovern report that um, highlighted uh, the importance of saturated fat and heart disease risk as, as a major feature of that. And again, it was in the context of limiting total fat um, and not limiting carbohydrate. Um, and, that, and that really has uh, sort of stayed with uh, the guidelines in one form or another. I'll just mention historically um, that I sort of came into the picture much later, mm -hmm. uh, inheriting those guidelines. Um, and uh, both in my own research, which we can talk about, as well as work of many others, um, came to realize that there were some real holes in that uh, in that mechanism hmm. that may have led to misunderstanding of how to manipulate diet, uh, in the case of heart disease risk at least, um, in the context of a population which was progressing from um, early days, even before the 50s, um, uh, when the people tended to be more active and um, uh, were uh, perhaps uh, uh, more sensitive to dietary cholesterol and saturated fat. Uh, but uh, over the years, um, and we can talk about this as well, um, we sort of converted to a society where the majority of individuals are overweight and have metabolic issues connected to adiposity. And the guidelines that were focused on just lowering cholesterol by reducing saturated fat no longer covered uh, the metabolic problems that individuals face when they develop this so-called metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So the population has changed, but the guidelines have been really slow um, to evolve, to uh, uh, really meet the differing metabolic responses of individuals um, in the current population, and they continue to emphasize the same. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you know, roughly in the in the mid 1900s, if we go back a few decades, the thinking was, um, well, saturated fat appears to raise blood cholesterol levels. High blood cholesterol is correlated with bad cardiovascular outcomes. It is, and from that. The conclusion was basically drawn in terms of how the guidelines were set that one should minimize not just saturated fat but total fat and replace that with carbohydrates and so so uh, at, at the time sort of when that was the thinking and, and that became influential what was actually like the strength of the evidence were these coming from randomized controlled trials were these mostly just correlational observations that were made how, how good was the evidence at the time for this idea Right, so that's that's a, that's a that's a good question, and I'll try to keep the answer simple. But um, it's uh, uh, <laughs> there's some aspects of this that really require uh, some detailed explanation. Um, uh, as you mentioned, there's really two sources of data that can be used to uh, try to establish causality. Uh, one is randomized controlled trials, where one uh, takes a population and assigns them to one or another diet and looks to see what the consequences are in terms of health outcomes. Um, the second is observational data, uh, taking uh, usually recorded data, historical data, uh, self-reported data, uh, and dietary intake and connecting that uh, with various other measurements, but ultimately with uh, with outcomes. Um, uh, both of those uh approaches um and particularly the observational data um uh, can be can be flawed um in terms of how one interprets causality um because it's not uh, as simple as uh, uh either a genetic test where you know you've got one gene doing one thing and that causes a certain outcome that's that's as close as we get to causality i think in research um in, in terms of in terms of treatments um again it's it's easier to establish causality if one uses a single molecule a drug um, such as a statin drug uh, which lowers cholesterol we know the cause of that cholesterol lowering of statins when it comes to diet um, we have uh, all these variables which we just talked about plus the fact that when you're changing a macronutrient such as fat uh, against carbohydrate if you're, if you're changing that distribution um, you can't really be sure um, what the uh, any, any, it, it, that any uh, outcome related to heart disease is is due to that change per se, because there's too many other variables that are changing. You can't control all of them. And observational data um, are even more deeply flawed because when it's dealing with historical records or patients or, or they're recording their intakes and they're being analyzed. But um, uh, as much as one can do to try to validate uh, that type of questionnaire approach in particular, um, 
it still has um, some serious questions as to um, whether this is really a valid measure, particularly of diet over time. Um, Loop at Harvard School of Public Health has done the best job, or one of the better jobs around in terms of trying to uh, standardize uh, that approach, but it's still it's inherently flawed. Um, uh, and it's really dependent on, uh, on statistical uh, considerations that also can carry some uh, downside in terms of how one interprets the, yeah. the causality aspect. It, so yeah, so it, causality it, is difficult to establish in, in both of those systems. But to, if, you, if you want me to go back to your question, um, the randomized trials uh, that were carried out um, in the, in, I think in the, in the 60s, um, uh, I can't remember the exact dates now, but there were, there were several uh, large randomized controlled trials in which the goal was to examine the role of dietary fat and heart disease risk. Um, and uh, we've summarized that uh, those trials uh, uh, in various ways did uh, show that diets that were uh, limited in saturated fat um, and were higher in another form of fat, unsaturated fat, uh, particularly polyunsaturated fat, which is um, at the uh, in the chemical sense, quite different from saturated fat. Um, those diets where uh, saturated fat was reduced and polyunsaturated fat was increased um, did lower heart disease risk. Um, there have been criticisms of each of those studies that I won't go into um, uh, in terms of various features that kind of dampen the uh, conviction of uh, uh, causality. Um, but the main issue that I've pointed out, which has been overlooked in general, is that those diets were very high in polyunsaturated fat, which is the kind of fat that comes from um, uh, from seeds and, and nuts, uh, for example, or in, in salad oils. Um, there's a whole contingent of people that feel that polyunsaturated fat can induce other adverse effects. But in these studies, uh, the intake was very high. And um, when... Uh, can't be sure whether it's the reduction in saturated fat or the increase in polyunsaturated fat that was responsible for the benefit. Um, and that has evolved uh, in, in the observational studies um, to considering uh, uh, the ratio of saturated fat to polyunsaturated fat um, uh, in the diet as a, uh, an index of um, metabolic impact on heart disease risk. Mm -hmm. um, but one doesn't know really whether it's the numerator or the denominator. Is, it, is the polyunsaturated fat mm -hmm. uh, good guy and saturated fat neutral, yeah. or saturated fat bad? Is that good? You, you can't you can't dissect. Yeah. The I see. So, so they did studies where they, they looked at saturated and polyunsaturated fat intake. Saturated fat when saturated fat went down and polyunsaturated went up, they saw some benefits in terms of health outcomes, but they can't be sure if it's one or both of those. Is it the saturated well, fat going down or the poly going up? It was interpreted as a saturated fat going down. I mean, all, all, all the guidelines since then and some you know definitive so-called uh, reports from American Heart Association that justify current guidelines, for example, point to those randomized trials as a, a key element uh, in uh, uh, making the connection between saturated fat and heart disease risk, but but really did not consider the fact, in my view, that um, there could be benefits through very high intakes of polyunsaturated fat that were responsible for the benefit, and saturated fat was really uh, just a sort of a neutral background component. That would be the extreme other interpretation of those studies, which has not been generally uh, talked about. Yeah, and one other thing that strikes me as being potentially relevant too, especially when we look back at studies that were done years and years ago and try and interpret them interpret them uh, for people today is um, let, let, let's just say okay you look at those studies and and someone decides I want to say increase my polyunsaturated fat intake or decrease my saturated fat intake you know at the time these studies were done when someone eats polyunsaturated fats, are the food are the foods that were giving them those fats different back then than they would be today? Well, and, and, yeah. right. Yeah. No, 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 no. And so I, I want to talk more about how these dietary guidelines are actually established. So, like, like literally, how does this process work? How do they determine which studies to consider when they set like you, you, when they set the USDA dietary guidelines? Um, how do they evaluate the studies and and what does that look like? Well, um, that's 
that's a question that has a lot of um, uh, issues that have been raised recently, in particular about the process. Um, originally, as I mentioned, um, they, they evolved from uh, the McGovern report and, and related uh, data um, from a, a group of individuals who were selected based on their expertise um, in this area um, to come up with formulas uh, for dietary guidelines that were as much as possible at that time based on ways of estimating the distribution, what the optimal distribution of uh, various fats and carbohydrate intake, for example, should be uh, advised for the general population. So that was based on a committee process that um, evolved uh, subsequently to, and I don't remember exactly the time course of when the transition occurred, um, but over uh, the subsequent years, um, uh, at some point, um, this was formalized into a, a five-year cycle of uh, dietary guidelines that were generated and are being generated by committees, uh, uh, or at least th there's recommendations for these guidelines that are established by committees uh, selected for um, their expertise in various aspects of nutrition and health. Um, and they meet every five years uh, and prepare reports. Those reports um, are have been based on um, what was thought to be the available evidence uh, to support the recommendations that that committee came up with. Uh, and that process uh, has undergone some serious uh, evaluation and criticism based on uh, the way that uh, the evidence is presented to the committee and the kind of evidence that's available to present to the committee. Um, so. Again, I'm not sure, I can't give you the exact timeline, but I think maybe it was probably about 10 years ago, um, uh, I was part of a committee that was um, appointed by the National Academy of Sciences of Food and Nutrition Board uh, in the Institute of Medicine um, to uh, provide um, the evidence at that time to support, or at least to allow uh, the dietary guidelines processes to, uh, to evaluate um, the effects of various macronutrients mm -hmm. on health. And that was really the first time there was ever a targeted effort um, to, in an unbiased, as global way as much as possible, assemble data. So we met for quite a long time. It was quite an intensive effort because we had to cover uh, fats and the different kinds of fats, carbohydrates, protein, cholesterol. Um, and it was uh, a very extensive process. And that presented uh, data, which eventually led to some, um, it moved the needle a little bit on the dietary uh, recommended intakes of fat and carbohydrate, which we can talk about perhaps um, if you'd like. But the um, uh, that has only been done once. That was a one-time effort. And since then, the guidelines, maybe even more than 10 years ago, at least the last several uh, five-year cycles, um, while they've certainly alluded uh, to that um, in, in, uh, inventory uh, that we assembled um, have tried to update as much as possible, as much as they thought possible, um, uh, the uh, evidence base for uh, making their recommendations. Um, that's been criticized because um, it hasn't always been up to date. In fact, the, the, the very last cycle, um, I've been part of a group that have um, published uh, critiques um, of that process. And uh, as a result of uh, those critiques, um, there was a, uh, there was a um, another panel convened by the National Academy, which I couldn't serve on uh, because I was conflicted in terms of some of my other research. Um, but I was a, an advisor to that process, which was aimed uh, not at um, uh, the guidelines themselves, but at the process. Uh, for, by which the guidelines are developed, and a series of recommendations were made, including the way the evidence is developed, uh, keeping it up to date, making it transparent, uh, dealing with, with conflicts of interest that may be represented by the members of the committee that should be considered in the end um, uh, as part of the assessment of their product. Um, so this, uh, and, and we just published a paper recently, I think it's been published, I can't remember, it, I think it's been published, um, where, uh, where we pointed out that those guidelines have really not been um, fully adhered to even in the last cycle. So we'll, we have a current cycle uh, that's due in, in 2025 
Um, I don't know where that stands. I certainly have not been in touch or involved with that current cycle in any mm -hmm. way. But um, uh, at least there has been recognition that um, through this report and through other critiques that the evidence base has to be strengthened um, mm -hmm. beyond what's been currently used. The other important aspect of the dietary guidelines process is that everything I've just talked about relates to the work of a committee, a committee of scientists, uh, health, uh, health scientists and uh, people that have expertise in various aspects of, of nutrition. There's also been concern about the, um, uh, the effect of, on the environment, which goes a little bit beyond um, uh, the health effects of the foods themselves. So it's a, a, a mixed set of disciplines um, that form this committee. Um, but their report um, is not uh, does not represent the guidelines themselves. That report is provided to um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Health and Human Services Departments, which jointly oversee the production of the dietary guidelines that are actually implemented um, for policy purposes and for public education. Um, and they don't always accept uh, the specific recommendations of the science committee. And there's been concern about that because uh, of what I think can be obvious concerns that the USDA in particular has a mission not only uh, related to food and, uh, and and the health of population, but also um, the uh, agriculture industry itself. Mm. Um, and, and that can, uh, despite efforts to uh, avoid uh, those conflicts, uh, it, it, nevertheless, there's a concern that um, some of the uh, ways that the uh, scientific report has been implemented um, at that level uh, have been um, influenced uh, by considerations that go beyond the science. I see. So, so these uh, committees of scientific experts—that's that's simply one input that goes right. in to right. how the USDA and these organizations set these guidelines. There are other inputs coming in from other places. I, I don't know if it makes sense to talk about what some of those other inputs are. No. But even within the scientific committee, you mentioned yeah. you know the possibility for conflicts of interest. What are some of those conflicts in that that you've seen over the years? Well, I don't want to point point figures uh, in part because uh, uh, I've 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 had my own conflicts uh, in terms of where research support comes from, uh, which have led me to uh, be involved in some activities but not others, uh, where those conflicts could come into play. Um, and the reason for this is one that I'm very sympathetic to, uh, and which I think can be strongly justified, and that is um, nutrition research, uh, particularly regarding uh, effects on. Uh, chronic disease, long-term health outcomes um, of dietary uh, changes uh, is extremely difficult to do. Um, it's uh, it requires um, teams of investigators. Uh, proper studies should have many uh, participants. Um, they should be long-term, uh, and we start adding the and, and providing ideally providing the foods themselves uh, uh, as a way of assessing their their the impact of the diet on on health outcomes. All of that is an extremely uh, challenging um, uh, set of issues that make these projects quite expensive and difficult to support. Um, we have um, government support coming from the National Institutes of Health, primarily some of it from the USDA, um, that have uh, supported research and supported some of my own research. Um, uh, and there certainly is interest within those agencies for providing strong science. But the scale of research and the cost of research and the number of issues that have to be dealt with uh, really exceed the capacity of those institutes to support research. So we, so we as a group, and although I'm sort of moved away from this in my own research, but over over the years, I was part of this group that was really relied very heavily uh, on uh, support from industry to have the funds uh, and the resources to be able to do studies on that scale. Uh, and the key is. Um, as much as possible to separate um, the work of the project from the interests of the sponsors in, that, in those cases. And that can be difficult and sometimes almost impossible to prove to the critical public is saying, well, are mm -hmm. these results um, really uh, true results or have they somehow been influenced by the sponsor? So, so, so the problem is that many of these uh, experts on the committee getting to your question um, have done research which is perfectly good research published in high impact, mm -hmm. which which would not necessarily be questioned, um, but um, in, in those cases, um, there was a significant uh, support coming from 
uh, food industry uh, sources that could be um, the basis for challenging the mm -hmm. positive conflict. Yeah, so it sounds like just like the nature of this research is that the the studies to be done properly at a large enough scale with a high enough sample size and, and to be done well, there's so much that goes into it. It's so resource intensive that it's and it's so expensive um, that there's not enough funding coming from places like the NIH, um, et cetera. And so a lot of it then is um, is also receiving funding from industry. And because something gets funded from industry, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's it's contaminated in any way, um, but there's always that concern. Right. The, the best, that's that's exactly right. That's, you just described what I was really getting at, that that that, that is um, uh, a fact of, of life in, in, in nutrition research, at least as it relates to long-term health consequences of the major uh, macronutrients. Um, we, we really require, uh, in, in most cases, some ancillary support um uh and and that and that can come from industry and the way um uh that that's dealt with or should be dealt with um is when publications appear there there really should be a statement saying that the, these results were not influenced in any way by the sponsor you and and that can be true uh, the, the, for example let me give you my case <laughs> as an example uh uh when i started off um uh, looking at dietary effects on heart disease risk and lipids in particular, um, I was facing some of the same issues you discussed. I did get a grant from NIH at the time, but it was a very small grant. I think we, could, we studied like six people. It was a it was an intensive study mm -hmm. in this tiny group of individuals. And I realized at that time that, that wasn't going to cut it. So I took advantage of an opportunity offered by um, the National Dairy Council um, to fund a large program which was initially a million dollars a year uh, for, for five years, a big center, which I was really excited about um, the opportunity that I presented for doing things on the scale we talked about and doing mechanistic studies as well as human uh, intervention trials. It was highly competitive. Um, they awarded one grant and it was ours. So we actually um, got that uh, center funded through uh, this uh, amazing uh, resource. And it raised all the issues we just talked about. How are we going to conduct the science in a way that uh, was not con connected to the sponsorship? And we, and so that's a, that's the sort of thing that we dealt with and should be dealt with is established at the outset. If you're taking uh, uh, research funding from groups such as National Dairy Council, you want to be sure that what you're coming up with at the end is not somehow um, uh, in, in, incorrectly. Uh, assigned benefit to things that should not be mm -hmm. beneficial. When a, when a group like that sets up, you know, when they decide to fund research like that, how, how exactly do they advertise it? Are they just saying we want to give someone mo money to do research in general on dairy, or are they how specific are they getting in terms of what the funds should be used for? That, that's an interesting question. It takes me back. I mean, this this grant, I, uh, in fact, this goes back to believe it or not, nineteen eighty nine which is when this program in my lab got started. Um, and um, uh, it was uh, it was advertised to people uh, in nutrition research, in parts of nutrition at university. It was, it was, so the announcement was widely distributed. So there were quite a few applicants for this uh, from, a, from across multiple institutions. And so at that process, I think, was fairly um, uh, uh, undirected. It wasn't an effort to fund specific people. I can tell you, I, I I didn't expect to be funded. I was thrilled when it turned out we were funded, um, but there was nothing in advance that would um, have been, uh, steered it uh, that way or any other way um, on that side of things. Um, uh, then it underwent, uh, and so, and this was the brainchild of um, the scientific leadership at the National Dairy Council, which does have a science arm um, and still does. Um, and um, uh, and what they asked for was um, important findings related uh, to uh, diet and health, um, and were obviously very interested in the role of dairy in that regard. That was certainly one of the driving forces uh, to uh, establish the science that would, I think, in their view, um, strengthen the case for uh, some features of diet and health that could be favorably affected um, by dairy. So that clearly would be uh, in the background uh, for the um, uh, formulation of this program. But when it was actually delivered as a um, 
uh, as a request called the request for applications or RFA. It was it was sent out as a as an RFA with a broad uh, categories of uh, work that would be funded, uh, genetic work, uh, work in clinical trials. So, and this is the way NIH functions as well. It was very much based on an NIH, the federal model, where the various uh, components of the program um, would were suggested in the announcement, and then we were asked to respond um, to uh, those components in ways that would be considered um, appropriate for the, the grant program. Th that underwent pretty rigorous peer review, uh, uh, which is, of course, also should be part of any process for uh, research, whether it's uh, industry sponsored or not. Um, but because of the scale of the uh, funding uh, in particular uh, and the unique nature of this program at the time, um, and I, of course, I don't know who, I don't remember who the reviewers are, but they were, uh, the, the, our proposal, which uh, was sent in in response to this RFA was reviewed at, at the two levels, both uh, by external uh, scientific reviewers and also within um, the uh, uh, National Dairy Council and also the USDA, which oversees um, Dairy Council. Um, uh, and I should mention that the funding uh, that uh, was used to support this program uh, comes from something called the Checkoff Program, uh, which by a certain amount of money. Um, that comes in. I forget what the exact rate is. It's a you know a few cents or, or whatever per dollar of uh, dairy um, products that are sold um, are allocated um, uh, have been allocated to uh, uh, marketing of dairy. But that category was divided into research as well. So there's both research and marketing, and um, and that amount of money was available through this checkoff program for the research side. Um, and the research was separated from marketing. We were not involved in the marketing. We were involved in the research side. Um, and um, as I said, that was uh, rigorously reviewed. And we subsequently, uh, in all our papers since then, because I, I, we were able to renew this program for a couple of decades, actually. I stayed with this um, uh, uh, support, which continued to generate observations that were both um, publishable, uh, relevant to human health, but also of interest to the sponsors. Um, and uh, those are all reviewed and uh, published in peer reviewed journals. Um, and I think in many, uh, I can't remember exactly how we handled this initially, but um, uh, the, the important thing is that um, we were uh, in our contract with the sponsors um, ensured that we could um, write whatever we needed to write based on our science without any input from the sponsors at all. Um, they were given the opportunity to look at the papers before they were published, um, particularly if there were any uh, uh, intellectual property or patent issues involved, which there haven't been in, our, in my case. Um, but that was strictly for review, and they could comment, but they had no um, ability to in any way impact what we actually were saying. And, um, and that is the important safeguard that one really has to enforce. And I think the kind of people that we... Uh, are, are have been considered and have been involved with the dietary guidelines process. I'm sure are all you know, you know, uh, understand that and practice uh, that approach. Um, uh, but it nevertheless, uh, on paper, leaves this connection, which is which you can't erase. That that connection just is is something that can always be uh, used to challenge mm -hmm. results. So, when we think about what the USDA dietary guidelines say today with respect to dietary saturated fat, dietary cholesterol, and cardiovascular disease. What do the guidelines say to the, today? And what is your view on how well those guidelines reflect the totality of the relevant literature here? Okay. So this is another big question. Um, and you'll pardon me if I have to spend a bit of time uh, giving you all the reasons that uh, I uh, can uh, bring to bear on answering it, uh, all the issues that um, I've been involved with myself, as well as those we've called from work of others in the field. Um, so uh, the guidelines uh, relatively early on um, considered uh, the need to limit saturated fat as a key element, particularly for, for heart, specifically for heart disease prevention by lowering blood cholesterol. That's the, that's the argument um, that uh, has stood the test of time in terms of how the guidelines are currently developed um, and implemented, um, uh, a cut point of 10% of calories of saturated fat um, was uh, established early on. 
that is the guidelines um, did and continue to recommend um, that individuals limit their intake of saturated fat uh, to less than 10 percent to reduce the risk of heart disease uh, and that was embedded in the uh, guideline for total fat which was uh, uh, in the federal guidelines set at around 30 percent that's been somewhat liberalized recently i should mention that there were such, there were guidelines and i could have mentioned this earlier um, that uh, were also developed, developed for heart disease uh, health by the american heart association and just as a brief aside um, uh, I became chairman of the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee um, a couple of decades ago um, and inherited uh, these prior guidelines for total and saturated fat as well as other elements of the diet for heart disease health. Um, and I wrote, uh, I, I chaired a com the committee that wrote a set of guidelines uh, in, I think, 1996, ultimately, that um, really extended uh, the previous um, uh, approaches uh, adopted both by uh, the government and their and their guidelines as well as the American heart for a total and saturated fat but at that time I was doing work of my own which um, we can talk about perhaps uh, as part of this discussion a little bit later um, that convinced me that that uh, that cut point was really not based on uh, anything specific to that 10 percent figure and that was really also consistent with what we found in the um, report that I had mentioned earlier uh, convened by the uh, Food and Nutrition Board. Um, and we recognized that that 10% figure was really a way of just uh, hitting a, a level that would reduce um, the average intake of saturated fat in the population, at least in, in, in those years, um, uh, and thereby lower blood cholesterol levels and heart disease risk. So it was set as a target, um, not because the 10% was some magic number, but because that seemed to be a feasible goal that could be achieved um, in the population as a way of pushing um, the risk for the population uh, down for heart disease. Um, so, so that has stood up. So the question is, <clears throat> is that uh, appropriate at all? And I can give you <laughs> um, a whole set of concerns that we've raised and published on that, um, in my view at least, challenge um, the idea of having a specific cut point like that at all. Um, and it starts with the fact that saturated fat is really a way of describing a particular class of fat, fatty acids, which constitute fat. There's, you know, uh, a fat molecule has uh, three fatty acids attached to it, uh, a glycerol backbone that forms a triglyceride. Um, and it can also be phospholipids and other fats, but um, the term saturated is applied when the bulk of those fatty acids um, have all of their um, bonds uh, saturated uh, with hydrogen. I, I, we can discuss the chemistry if anybody's interested, but th th that's that's where the word saturated comes from, is that these are um, a particular form of fat that have this property, um, as opposed to uh, fats that have the same number of fatty acids, but that uh, don't have as much of the saturated fat uh, component have more um, fatty acids that in which um, the hydrogen is not saturating those bonds. So there's um, they become unsaturated, either monounsaturated when there's one uh, one bond that is um, uh, that loses the hydrogen, or polyunsaturated where there's several. And there's different classes, of both monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, and there are different classes of saturated fats. So we have a across the board a huge heterogeneity. Um, in the chemical nature of e both the, the, the fats themselves, saturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated, but within each of those categories, there's heterogeneity, and that certainly applies for saturated fat and fatty acids in particular. So having said that, um, one can ask, well, why have a saturated fat uh, cut point? Why, why not talk about uh, specific fatty acids? Well, that gets really complicated because we don't have the data um, mm. in many we certainly don't have the outcome data that gets back to the point where you we're not going to do a study where we change one specific fatty acids usually uh, and follow somebody for 30 years uh, make sure they're following the diet and see what happens it just you just can't do that it's just not feasible yeah so that that that's uh, that's the reason for the lumping um so the lumping is based on um this uh evidence which is uncontrovertible that um if one substitutes saturated fat for either unsaturated fat or carbohydrate, one does raise the LDL cholesterol. Um, that's 
in, in most cases, not everybody, there's variation in that response. For example, people that are obese, and we published a paper and others have shown, if you're overweight, kind of paradoxically, um, you, you don't get that effect at all. Hmm. Uh, but but in general, if so you, you increase you, saturated fat intake, you increase over, LDL cholesterol. Over the population in general, as I say, there, there, there's variation in that. It doesn't apply to everything, but it, yes. Uh, and we and others have shown that repeatedly. So there's it, it, across the population, that relationship is well established. Similarly, um, there is evidence which uh, supports this guideline that um, raising LDL or, and, and, and also the other direction, lowering LDL, uh, affects the risk of heart disease uh, unfavorably or favorably. If you lower LDL, um, you see a proportional reduction in risk. Um, but that may depend on the way the, the diet is, is changed, whatever the way the saturated fat or, uh, or the way, the, I'm sorry, it, it may depend on the way the cholesterol is lowered. Um, and saturated fat may have uh, some effects that differ from other mechanisms for uh, lowering um, uh, cholesterol, limiting saturated fats, such as statin drugs. So you can't necessarily extrapolate from the data um, in which uh, lowering LDL has been connected with heart disease um, to make that connection with saturated fat. And again, there's multiple reasons for that, one of which is the heterogeneity of the saturated fat. The other is the foods that the saturated fat is contained in. So using so so one of the enduring uh, underlying uh, aspects of our criticism of uh, this guideline is uh, the focus on saturated fat as a class, as opposed to um, specific foods containing those saturated fats, which differ, um, and the potential for differing saturated fats to have different effects, um, the substitution of other nutrients, how, how that reduction is achieved. So um, about, uh, I guess, probably 13 years ago now, um, uh, we decided to do a review um, and uh, ultimately performed what's called a meta-analysis, which is a formal statistical analysis um, of studies that uh, have been thought to uh, support um, a relationship of um, saturated fat to heart disease risk uh, through this cholesterol mechanism. Um, and as we talked about a few minutes ago, that included um, the randomized clinical trial data um, and even a few trials since the early ones, um, but more, uh, much more data coming from um, the observational epidemiological data where one has large populations and, and tries to connect the dots in terms of saturated fat and heart disease. And what we found is that um, the literature at that time um, failed to show a significant relationship between saturated fat intake itself per se uh, and heart disease risk. If you try to just as much as possible uh, from particularly from the epidemiological studies, um, is to just narrow in on saturated fat intake as a as a component of uh, diet as assessed by these imperfect uh, tools. Um, if you use that data, um, one could really not show a significant relationship to heart disease risk, and that created a furor um, at the time. It was um, I, I, I was sort of somewhat prepared for it, but not the intensity of the, of the pushback because um, here we were um, uh, take, taking down one of the principles of um, the dietary recommendation mm -hmm. for heart disease risk reduction um, and in my case uh, since much of my research is focused on LDL it was a little bit ironic because um, uh, uh, I certainly never backed away from the importance of LDL and heart disease risk but we could not we could not connect those dots and and there may be many reasons for that starting with the foods themselves and all the things we talked about in terms of the context in which the saturated fat is consumed. But here is where um, I'm going to take a, a little tour through an aspect of this that relates to the LDL side of things. Okay. Because, uh, when I began my uh, my own research on lipoproteins, or at least when I uh, took uh, continued to do work that I started when I was actually uh, in medical school, but um, went on to study lipoproteins in a lab uh, at, at University of California, Berkeley, which was really the, the lab where uh, lipoprotein um, uh, science was first started, really, in a way that allowed the study of different kinds of lipoproteins that could be uh, isolated and prepared and um, analyzed in depth. Um, my research really focused on, um, on LDL and the fact that LDL is not just cholesterol, um, it's a cholesterol as a component of 
uh, what we call an LDL particle. Um, and the particle is a spherical molecule that uh, is circulating in the blood that transports cholesterol. So when you measure LDL cholesterol, you're measuring the cholesterol in that particle. But there's many other features of that particle uh, that come into play when it comes to biological uh, effects of the, of the LDL particles. And uh, just jumping ahead over the years, there's been um, progressive acceptance, I think widespread acceptance, of the fact that it's the LDL particle that we should be considering as the uh, vehicle that brings cholesterol into the arteries for plaque formation, um, not just the cholesterol uh, content of the particle, but the um, particle itself. And uh, getting back to my early work in the lab, um, using the tools that were available in that really superb uh, uh, research environment, uh, with a lot of expertise in separating lipoproteins, um, we discovered, in, and since we discovered, that LDL is not a single class of particles. Um, that LDL uh, particles represent a spectrum um, of particles that can be differentiated based on uh, their size. Um, particles can be smaller or larger. Um, and as they get larger, they have more lipids, including more uh, cholesterol. So one has a spectrum of particles um, ranging from um, larger cholesterol-rich uh, LDL to smaller uh, cholesterol-depleted particles. And what we discovered, and which has subsequently been uh, confirmed repeatedly, um, is that uh, counterintuitively, and somewhat paradoxically, um, the strongest relationship of LDL particles to heart disease risk was not with those particles that contain more cholesterol, but in the smaller particles called small dense mm. LDL that um, uh, are a distinct class of particles, um, which have been shown to have properties beyond their cholesterol content, which um, can form uh, the, the basis for uh, a more uh, uh, toxic effect on the mm. heart. Um, Ronald, I'm hearing some tapping in the background. Oh, that may be me. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so so it's not purely the cholesterol per se here. It has something to do with the particle size. With it, yeah, with with the with, with the type of particle itself, and the particle size is a way of identifying uh, mm. these particular particles, uh, the smaller ones that have these uh, more uh, uh, damaging effects on the artery, um, including. Uh, uh, for example, um, the, the fact that they uh, are more likely to stay in the bloodstream than larger particles because they are taken up less effectively by the liver. So in order to get cholesterol out of the body, and this is the basis for all of our efforts to lower blood cholesterol, um, most of us are focused on promoting uh, means of increasing LDL removal from the blood. That's the way statins work, for example, um, by interacting with receptors at the cell surface in the liver. Uh, those smaller particles are have less um, ability to bind those receptors. And it's been shown that as a result, they circulate in the blood longer. And as a result of that, there's greater exposure uh, to tissues, particularly the artery itself, where the blood is circulating, um, that can trap these particles. Um, so this prolonged residence time is a big issue um, that may point the finger um, at a mechanism, at least part of the mechanism, for the relationship of these particles to heart disease risk. Uh, but it's also been shown um, uh, that they can enter the artery relatively easily, partly based on their smaller size. And they also have physical properties that cause them to bind more tightly uh, to the artery. Sometimes uh, we think of uh, uh, just things going into the arteries as the only direction, but we know that um, things go, can go in and out of arteries. Um, uh, but these particles uh, can go in and have much more trouble getting out, so they get trapped. And once they're trapped, um, it's been shown, we showed and others have shown, um, that they are more readily oxidized. They undergo oxidative properties. Once they um, are taken out of the plasma, um, we don't have an antioxidant environment to protect them from oxidation. Um, that oxidation promotes a number of changes which lead to inflammation and the buildup of plaque. Um, by mechanisms that uh, extend the damage due to the cholesterol itself, so that inflammation becomes a big part of the evolution of a plaque from a more benign uh, to a more malignant form that can cause heart attack and stroke and when it's in the brain. Um, that inflammatory aspect initiated by oxidation is another uh, feature of the small LDL that, uh, to which the uh, risk has been attributed. Um, and all of that is in relation to larger particles, which can have these effects, but 
um, to a much uh, differing degree. Um, so that um, taking going back to the question of diet and, and LDL um, led me to include in my proposal um, for this program that I described earlier that we initiated um, a number of years ago, one of the major projects was to uh, test the current idea uh, at the time that a low fat diet would be beneficial for heart disease risk. And we hypothesized that that would benefit those small LDL particles because that's what we thought would be a mechanism for um, a benefit of reduced dietary fat. Well, what we found is what changed the direction of my own research and led to some other impacts uh, on the field, um, is that following that traditional diet, low in fat and high in carbohydrate, um, actually uh, had rather small benefit on, on the people with heart disease risk who had more of the small LDL. We, we classified them as what we call pattern B, small LDL versus pattern A, which is large LDL. These are two distinct subgroups of the population. The pattern B individuals, um, the ones at higher risk, um, showed some benefit. But um, uh, at the same time, 25% uh, or so of those who had a normal lipid profile, which we call pattern A, actually converted to pattern B. Um, mm -hmm. So low fat, high carbohydrate appeared to worsen the risk in a subset of individuals um, who uh, converted to this higher risk pattern as a result of this diet. And we subsequently showed that this is not related to the fat content changing, uh, it's related to the carbohydrate content changing. So, so for about one in four people, increasing your carbohydrate consumption has this effect? In that particular population, um, uh, yes. It, it, uh, yes. Uh, and we also, I just want to say that uh, this was a healthy, non-obese population. Um, we and others have shown uh, subsequently that if one is overweight um, or obese, um, that um, there's a much higher prevalence of this high-risk trait. And uh, and we now know that body weight, particularly um, what we call visceral adiposity, fat in the belly or fat in the liver, for that matter, um, uh, in excess can drive uh, this this trait as well. Um, and so, so in the end, um, it's uh, uh, two separate mechanisms, one involving carbohydrate, the other involving body fat, that can contribute uh, to the formation of this small LDL profile. Hmm. So how um, how good, what exactly are drugs like statins doing and how effective are they at doing, uh, what do they change in terms of blood markers and how good are they at, um, in terms of cardiovascular disease risk? Okay, so... Um, Statins, you know, were just a huge breakthrough in the field um, as a means of lowering heart disease risk, and their efficacy has been shown repeatedly in terms of heart disease risk reduction. What are they doing that leads to risk reduction? Um, that's the question. So um, it starts with cholesterol. Statins um, specifically block uh, the uh, activity of an enzyme called hmg coy reductase, a very specific inhibition uh, of that enzyme, which is a crucial enzyme for cholesterol synthesis by the liver. As a result of that effect, um, the liver goes through a series of responses that result in uh, increased levels of these LDL receptors that suck more LDL out of the blood uh, and bring it to the liver. So the net result of this um, mechanism is a lowering of LDL, uh, mainly through uh, reduction, uh, through an increase in clearance from the blood, and to some extent by uh, reducing the, the synthesis of these elect proteins as well. So the LDL lowering effects are well established. Um, uh, what we've shown, um, and, and others have shown, is that this effect is more pronounced uh, for the larger LDL particles, and that um, the, the small, particularly the the very small LDL are more resistant, and that's because of uh, the feature I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that the particles have a lower affinity for the LDL receptor. And, but and so, there's a net, I just want to say there's a net reduction in everything else. So there's a, uh, so there's a, a, a up to a 50% reduction with the more potent statins at the higher doses, 50% or more reduction in LDL particles, which includes most of the small LDL, but not all of them. That's a benefit. Uh, and the second mechanism, which is also, I think, very important, goes beyond cholesterol lowering because uh, by inhibiting this enzyme, one can also reduce products that are pro-inflammatory. And as I mentioned, inflammation is a key element of plaque development. 
uh, and conversion to a more dangerous form um, that can cause heart attacks and stroke. Uh, and statins uh, are anti have an anti-inflammatory effect. And a marker for that is called C-reactive protein or CRP, um, which a friend and colleague of mine, Paul Ritker, um, has been instrumental in establishing um, as both a marker and potential target for statins because statins lower CRP uh, as an index of their anti-inflammatory effect. And the combination of those two mechanisms, I think, are really important for the ultimate uh, benefits the statins have been shown to have. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between dietary cholesterol intake and blood cholesterol levels? Okay, so that's another question. Uh, this one I'll try to uh, just to zone in on uh, the fact that when I was assigned to this committee that I mentioned uh, for the Food and Nutrition Board and National Academy of Sciences, um, I was given the task of writing the chapter of this volume on dietary cholesterol. That was my my topic. Uh, and I knew something about it. And as I, as I said, I was at that time involved with the American Heart and Nutrition Committee, and we were continuing to advocate at that time a generally accepted historical recommendation for limiting um, cholesterol intake to 300 milligrams a day, which is the equivalent of about one, one, one and a half egg yolks per day, something in that category. That, of course, comes from other sources as well, and fats contain cholesterol. So all of that was a guideline that was out there. Um, and I was charged with, uh, as part of this process, um, assembling uh, the evidence to support that guideline. And what we came up with was uh, that there is an effective dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol levels, and it's LDL cholesterol in particular. Um, but the magnitude of that effect um, was really pretty tiny. Uh, certainly compared with, for example, the saturated fat effect we just talked about, um, dietary cholesterol has a small uh, effect, which if, if one extrapolates that to its predicted effect in heart disease risk, it would take a population of the world, it would take a huge population to prove that that was a deleterious effect. Um, it was it was so small um, and uh, certainly did not support any particular number um, because there was a, con it's a continuous relationship. Um, of course, the risk and the cholesterol levels both went down as cholesterol intake went down, but um, uh, the the net a change in those measures and those uh, outcomes was was really not enough uh, in, in our in my view. And we try to get this in the report um, to justify um, that guideline, uh, which could be used as a benchmark, but not based on specific science. Uh, so speed forward for uh, I don't know another ten or fifteen years, and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, as well as the American Heart Association, finally recognized that um, this was not something that they should really be. Uh, pushing based on the science. And so that cholesterol uh, guideline has been um, uh, taken out of the guidelines, uh, which finally, I think, represents uh, the right move scientifically. Um, I should mention that um, most of the cholesterol that enters our system is actually produced by the body. Um, the amount we consume, um, if it's two or 300 milligrams a day, for example, within that uh, guideline, um, should be compared with the seven or eight or nine hundred milligrams per day coming from um, the synthesis of cholesterol by the body, by the liver, and other tissues. Um, and so, um, uh, when one lowers dietary cholesterol, one is not taking out a major source of cholesterol entering the system. Um, plus, which there's a lot of variation in how cholesterol is absorbed. Uh, there's receptors involved that um, can cause uh, relatively big response to dietary mm -hmm. cholesterol and others that small mm -hmm. response. So we have on top of the mechanism, we have a huge variation in the sensitivity of any given individual to dietary cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult to set a number that it would apply to the whole. So if a lot of the cholesterol is produced uh, internally, why does one have high cholesterol? What, what are the causes of someone getting very high cholesterol levels? Okay. So, um, Let's start with the very high cholesterol levels because that's the easiest uh, to talk about. Um, some of the groundbreaking work that ultimately led to a Nobel Prize uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Goldstein and Brown, who, who were studying this, um, was based on individuals uh, who have what's called familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, they have a genetic form of uh, elevation of LDL uh, that is characterized by a number of features, uh, including, importantly, uh, affected family members. Uh, uh, parents who carry this, one or more parents who carry this diagnosis, um, and it was well established uh, through many studies that if one has a more severe form of this condition, which we call FH from the hypercholesterolemia, 
um, when it's at high risk of heart disease, and when it has the most extreme form, when one inherits a gene from both parents, uh, uh, LDL cholesterol levels can go through the roof. They can be four or five or six times normal. And uh, younger individuals, even children who have this condition, um, can have severe uh, coronary uh, plaque development and heart disease. Um, uh, and if one has one copy of the gene, which is present in about one in 200 or 250 individuals of the population, not rare, it's not super common, um, uh, but it's certainly not rare. Um, one is susceptible to the same trait and we can have LDL levels that are high. And the basis for that is mutations in the gene for the LDL receptor that uh, prevent uptake of, uh, by the liver of LDL particles, it prevents the LDL from binding. Um, and so that cause uh, is absolutely well established. Uh, not everybody with this genetic trait will get a heart attack. There's variation and other factors that might affect risk. But in general, there's a very strong uh, connection between the presence of this gene and its consequences on LDL and the risk for heart disease. Um, so it starts there with these very high levels. Um, to give you a, an idea of the numbers, um, we generally consider LDL cholesterol levels of less than 100 uh, to be in a healthy range for most people, lower for those at higher risk. Um, uh, people that have uh, the severe uh, form of hypercholesteremia I just mentioned can have levels of five or 600. People that have the intermediate form with just one dose of the gene can have levels of uh, three, two, two, two to 300. And so we've established a level of 190 as a cut point, uh, again, somewhat arbitrary, but it's a point at which if you have levels above that, you're very very likely to have inherited either that gene or, or other similar genes that block the removal of LDL from the blood. So that mechanism is well established. Beyond that, um, Genetics has given us a lot of data about other genes as well. Uh, that gene, as well as, as as others, have been studied extensively in relationship both to uh, LDL levels and heart disease risk. And so we have um, ways of collecting genetic information um, that can allow us to uh, get a risk score. That is, how many traits are one carrying? And this is across the whole genome, across all genes. Um, you know, you can you can scan for genes that have individually less extreme effects on LDL, but collectively can have a significant effect, uh, higher score, higher risk. Um, that risk score has been related to heart disease risk as well. Um, so th there's genetic evidence, both at the extremely high level, but also at the more conventional LDL levels um, below 190, um, that genetic factor is, for the most part, um, affecting um, the ability to clear LDL out of the blood um, can... Uh, uh, show causality uh, of, of LDL and, and, and heart disease risk. So, so genetics is a big part of it. Diet plays on top of that. So in terms of the spectrum of things that can affect LDL, uh, genetics is kind of the backbone framework, which we all inherit either tendency to high LDL or not, depending mm -hmm. on uh, what our parents have given us genetically. Um, on top of that, we have diet. We just talked about the effects of dietary saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, I mentioned that the dietary cholesterol effect is, is for most people, pretty small, although it can be high in, in some high responders. Uh, saturated fat, uh, depending on how one um, uh, produces the diet, can be reduced um, beyond what people conventionally eat. Um, which is in the range of maybe 12% of calories. If you go down to 6 or 7% of calories, you can reduce LDL. Um, but for most people, it's less than 10% reduction. It's not a big reduction. I can't give you the exact numbers because mm -hmm. it's from different studies. But it's a it's a relatively small effect mm -hmm. that can be uh, amplified by including uh, some of the fibers we talked about, uh, the saliva fibers in particular, and there's a diet um, that has been developed that can reduce um, LDL by as much as 20%. Um, uh, using uh, those principles, which begins to be at the range when it can achieve in statins. But as I mentioned, the more potent statins uh, can reduce LDL even further. So in in general, diet has quite a modest effect on, on cholesterol levels. Um, but one way you can lower them is to reduce saturated fat intake in addition to getting soluble fiber. Yes, those are two dietary approaches that can lower LDL. And certainly for people that have LDL levels that may be due to underlying genetic predisposition, uh, they nevertheless may be responsive to these dietary changes. In fact, they often are. 
uh, and we can sometimes bring the levels down. Uh, having said that, I'll say one more thing about the diet, and that is um, related to the dietary guidelines uh, issue we discussed earlier. Um, saturated fat has most of its effect on large LDL particles. It has, uh, for most people, a very small effect on the on the little guys, on the, on the, on the small LDL. So when one um, conversely lowers LDL by saturated fat reduction, and we published this a few, couple of years ago, as well as previously, um, one lowers uh, the large LDL, but has relatively minimal effects on the small LDL. So that gets back to one of the reasons to support what we talked about earlier, um, trying to connect saturated fat to heart disease risk by simply looking at LDL um, uh, may uh, overestimate the benefit uh, because the major effect is on the particles that have a smaller effect on risk and it, we're not affecting the particles uh, that are so prevalent in the population now uh, that have a greater effect. These these very small guys are, are, are really very minimally responsive to saturated fat. So the dietary effect varies across uh, the spectrum of LDL, it also varies across individuals, um, in part through their genetic nature. Um, uh, so it's another complicated question. I mentioned earlier a moment ago that uh, people that are obese, interestingly, uh, don't uh, respond to saturated fat. They make enough of their own saturated fat. Um, the, the dietary effect has relatively minimal uh, consequences. Um, uh, so, so that's so we so that's it. Diet. Um, uh, and genetics. And then uh, adiposity, as I mentioned, can raise LDL, but it raises the small LDL. So lowering body weight is effective in lowering small LDL particles. It can also affect the larger ones, but less um, uh, less prominently. Um, uh, there pro and uh, and there are these other components I mentioned um, in the diet being on saturated fat and cholesterol. Um, uh, people always ask me, can stress be a factor? The answer is yes, but it's very hard to quantitate. And it's... Um, uh, it, it's 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 usually uh, if there is an effect, it's not enough to really enter into uh, a formula to predict uh, cardiovascular mm -hmm. outcomes. Um, that's about that's about it for um, the the causes of uh, cholesterol uh, elevations in the population. When we talk about HDL cholesterol versus LDL cholesterol, these are commonly referred to respectively as good and bad cholesterol. Is that a useful shorthand to th to 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 refer to these? Do you think we should be using those terms? Is it really as simple as one's good and one's bad, so you should want higher levels of one and lower levels of the other one? H how much more nuance is actually there um, okay. when we talk about good and bad cholesterol? Well, I'll tell you, every question you've asked so far uh, is uh, is a question that has a very uh, extensive <laughs> set of answers, and I'll try to be uh, uh, careful about not making it too too limit too uh, uh, difficult uh, to to follow. Uh, in terms of the, the LDL and the bad cholesterol, we just reviewed actually one of the concerns I have is talking about LDL cholesterol. The cholesterol kind of LDL does not uh, give an indication. Of the small LDL particles, for example, it's it's, it's weakly correlated with with the particle distribution, um, and um, and therefore it's um, it's uh, somewhat flawed. Uh, it also includes another category of lipoproteins that we didn't mention for the Fischianos uh, who may be uh, listening to this. Uh, uh, I just mentioned there's a category called remnant lipoprotein cholesterol. So we have LDL which is the low density lipoproteins. And then we have these remnant particles, which are actually even large, they're, they're actually larger than the large LDL, but they are derived from breakdown of other particles uh, caused called VLDL, very low density lipoproteins that start off in the liver containing triglyceride as well as cholesterol. And as they're metabolized, as the triglyceride gets lost, they produce these remnants. These remnants are highly atherogenic. So we have uh, within the LDL spectrum, differences across large versus small LDL. But LDL cholesterol, also the standard clinical measurement, also includes remnant cholesterol. So one of the reasons, and I think one of the major reasons that LDL cholesterol has been pinpointed as bad cholesterol is because it includes these other uh, components. Mm -hmm. It's not some simple single uh, entity. Um, uh, Calling a good cholesterol, uh, I'm sorry, calling a bad cholesterol as a generic term is really, uh, for that reason, oversimplification, but it's at least in the right direction. I mean, this is a, this is higher risk. When it comes to HDL, HDL 
also contains cholesterol. It's a smaller particle, has less cholesterol than LDL for, uh, in most individuals, at least. Um, and its levels have been very strongly related inversely to heart disease risk, such that people that are walking around with high HDL levels um, uh, tend to have lower heart disease risk than individuals who have uh, low levels of HDL. And there's cut points where below which HDL reduction appears to be quite uh, harmful for many people. Um, there's genetic reasons for that. Uh, it can also be lowered if you're overweight in certain, again, to varying degrees uh, across the population, but um, obesity contributes to low HDL, and that is uh, correlated with higher heart disease risk. However, um, there have been two categories of research um, that have challenged the assumption that changing HDL uh, either in either direction would affect heart disease risk. One is genetic, and that is that uh, as opposed to genes that affect LDL that we talked about a few minutes ago, um, the genes that um, specifically affect HDL, uh, the collection of genetic effects in HDL, um, have not been shown to be correlated um, with heart disease risk. So people carrying genetic traits that, uh, for example, uh, raise HDL do not appear to be at lower heart disease risk as a result of those genes. So um, that's one line of evidence which has uh, been used to challenge the assumption that if you have low HDL, raising HDL would be beneficial. And there's a whole other category of, of data uh, that supports that um, conclusion. Um, and this is based on trials, uh, particularly involving uh, uh, a, a vitamin called niacin or nicotinic acid. Mm. Um, it's been known for decades um, to lower cholesterol, but also increases uh, HDL levels, can increase HDL levels quite substantially. Uh, we can discuss these trials in more detail, but the bottom line is that the effect on HDL uh, of, of those trials involving niacin uh, could not be connected to lower heart disease risk as well. So that has sort of challenged the assumption that um, simply having a correlation of HDL with heart disease risk, which does exist, doesn't really uh, guarantee that something that changes HDL is going to have the predicted effect. That argument, by the way, also applies to LDL. And it's another one of the arguments I've used to challenge the assumption that, well, we know LDL is related to heart disease risk. Uh, we know statins can reduce LDL and reduce heart disease risk. But do we know that the dietary effect on LDL is beneficial? Um, there have not been studies uh, that have really focused on that, as I discussed earlier. There was a large trial, and I'm going to go back now to one other line of evidence on the LDL side, where um, a, a large population uh, of women, uh, in what was called Women's Health Initiative, were treated uh, or were advised to follow a diet that was lower in saturated total fat and higher in carb. Um, and uh, at the end, there was really no significant impact on heart disease risk of, of that diet. So, um, so one can't infer from the relationships that we know for LDL and HDL as being quote good and bad um, that changing them in any particular way is going to be beneficial. And that also depends on other effects of the diet. It goes back to the argument. Um, I was making earlier the challenge saturated fat guideline. Um, uh, it, it really, uh, you need to consider other effects of foods beyond cholesterol lowering. So do all saturated fats uh, have that uh, effect? And if you give me a, a minute to sort of sidetrack back to that topic, um, what I'll mention is that, um, that there is data to support um, that certain types of saturated fat, uh, particularly those found in dairy foods, this, it's not my this is not my research, so I'm not conflicted by saying this, I don't think, um, uh, are associated with improved cardiometabolic health, uh, features that can predispose, for example, to diabetes and um, metabolic uh, risk of heart disease um, uh, th uh, that are benefited um, by um, the fatty acids or that are associated, uh, as I say, with benefits uh, of these fatty acids. And so there is some evidence, um, which is, the subject of some controversy and continual reevaluation, that the same amount of saturated fat, the total amount of saturated fat derived from dairy um, in particular and uh, other sources of saturated fat, non-dairy meat, tropical oils, um, have differing effects in heart disease risk, that the, that the dairy context has other effects that go beyond uh, cholesterol that um, can impact heart disease risk. So reducing um, dairy fat intake carries potentially the downside of pulling away those uh, those fats that might have beneficial effects. This is particularly uh, uh, related, particularly connected um, with uh, another 
way that dairy products are consumed, and that is through uh, ferment, ferment, fermented products such as yogurts and cheeses. Um, and and those fermented products, particularly for the yogurts, um, have also been associated with cardiometabolic benefits. Again, these are cross-sectional, some interventional studies. Um, and so, again, it points to the fact that simply labeling a product um, as uh, slightly harmful effects due to um, LDL raising uh, components uh, such as saturated fat have um, uh, uh, they do not necessarily relate to heart disease risk. Um, and then finally, getting back to that same arena of um, why I've been concerned about continuing to focus on saturated fat as the criterion for advising uh, uh, ways of reducing heart disease risk in the dietary guidelines um, is that um, I mentioned, for example, that most of the cholesterol synthesis uh, that we find in the body is produced by synthesis uh, from tissues, including the liver. Uh, the same is true for saturated fatty acids. Um, most of the saturated fatty acids that circulate in our body are synthesized by the liver. It's mm -hmm. by a process called de novo lipogenesis. Um, and so while dietary saturated fatty acids can contribute to the body's pool of uh, saturated fatty acids, um, for most individuals, and particularly those individuals who have these metabolic disturbances uh, that are derived from excess adiposity, for example, um, you know, what we call metabolic syndrome, who have insulin resistance and predisposed to diabetes, th those very prevalent uh, individuals, that large segment of the population, um, is actually producing a whole lot of saturated fatty acids um, from carbohydrates. It's the carbohydrates mm. that uh, drive this de novo lipogenesis process. And that just points the finger exactly at the opposite direction from reducing uh, fat. It points the direct uh, finger again at supporting the argument for uh, reducing de novo lipogenesis and fructose, which you talked about even earlier, uh, as a, a specific uh, sugar that drives um, some metabolic uh, uh, problems that lead to heart disease and diabetes. Um, fructose uh, drives de novo lipogenesis, and that's when mm -hmm. higher levels of fructose produce more of these saturated fatty acids. And and here is where, um, like with cholesterol, um, what's circulating in the blood um, is not the same thing as what we consume. What we mm -hmm. what's in the blood is 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 the endogenous saturated fatty acids, and once they're in the blood, they can be harmful. Saturated fats fatty acids do have harmful effects, but it's the circulating saturated fatty acids mm -hmm. that are impacted more by most people by carbohydrate than fat that, that drive this. And those effects can include both um, lipid synthesis, lipid uh, metabolism, as well as inflammatory uh, processes that can contribute to disease risk. I see. So those, when, when we go back and think about those original guidelines that sort of made the inference from the data, which wasn't proven, that if you decrease saturated fat and replace that with carbohydrates, not only was the saturated fat decrease probably not having at least as big an effect as they hoped, but actually uh, replacing those with carbohydrates was promoting lipogenesis and actually increasing circulating saturated fatty acids. Right. And then, and then that effect, again, if you have a diet that's extreme, which is low in saturated fat, high in polyunsaturated, polyunsaturated fat, and the carbohydrates are coming from healthy sources, you know, plant-based, uh, whole grain, et cetera, that effect would be minimized. But um, in practice, the way the guidelines uh, impacted the population and the food industry, which really made the best effort to comply with those earlier guidelines that promoted carbohydrate at expensive fat, um, included foods that really uh, were driving endogenous saturated fat production and could have adverse effects. Mm -hmm. and, and other, other mechanisms as well. Mm -hmm. When we think about... The different classes of fatty acids, so saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. There is heterogeneity even within those categories, but if we think about them at that level, um, the degree of saturation is related to how easily they can become oxidized. Um, is that true? Uh, 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 yes, uh, that may not be um, always uh, the important mechanism that affects the biological uh, effects, however. Um, uh, the differences uh, in the structure relate to uh, metabolic control through enzymes that pull away hydrogen atoms uh, and progressively make bit bonds change from saturated to unsaturated. Uh, when there's multiple unsaturated uh, bonds within the chemical structure of a fatty acid, it does become more readily oxidizable. Um, uh, uh, that 
may have mixed effects. It may not necessarily, that form of oxidation, it's not clear, uh, is, is adverse. Some, some people feel that it's an adverse effect. It's not clear to me that that's uh, significant enough to uh, warrant concern. Um, again, this, kind of, this topic is so complicated, I don't want to make it overly complicated. Um, but um, with, uh, within polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, there are two general categories which we didn't discuss. Um, one is where there's a specific um, unsaturated bond uh, in the in what's called the N minus three position. Those are called omega three fatty acids. And another, whether uh, the first bond is in the six position, those are called omega six fatty acids. Um, they're derived from different sources. Omega three fatty acids can be derived in the diet from flaxseed, but um, the form of uh, of, of omega three fatty acids that appears to have some metabolic benefits. Um, uh, uh, is mostly found in fatty fish who develop high levels of these omega-3 fatty acids. And that's been the study, the, the, the source of many studies trying to relate those fatty acids to benefits, including heart disease risk reduction. Those are complicated by the fact that some studies have shown benefit, but more recent studies have not. Uh, so it's still an area of some controversy. Uh, that's as opposed to the omega-6 fatty acids, which are the, fine, the, the major source of polyunsaturated fat in the diet coming from um, seeds and nuts and and and, and, and various oils um, that um, have these effects, uh, including uh, association with lower heart disease risk as well as lowering uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, so that's just another element of heterogeneity that um, segregates these two forms mm -hmm. of saturated fatty acids. When you get omega sixes from whole foods like nuts and things like this um that are unprocessed um and have have the fatty acids intact do those omega-6s have a different effect compared to if you cook them with them at high temperatures in the form of say a vegetable oil yeah well this is a, this is a topic that um i have been exposed to um uh, by interacting and even publishing with colleagues who have uh made the point that that type of processing can have adverse effects on the structure of these that could be uh, detrimental. I personally, um, uh, you know, accept, accept the, uh, uh, the arguments uh, to some extent. I just don't know personally whether I feel that this is um, enough of a factor that um, should cause people to avoid, I mean, perhaps, you know, t taking them after high temperatures. Uh, I, I, uh, but this is not my area of expertise, and I've I've tried to avoid making any conclusions based on what I see as a very complex literature and a lot of controversy in this field. Um, it occurs to me there's yet one other consideration um, regarding fatty acid uh, heterogeneity, and that is uh, what's called trans fatty acids. Mm -hmm. um, trans fatty acids uh, uh, are distinguished from what are called cis fatty acids um, by having um, hydrogen atoms uh, on on uh, both the top and the bottom of the structure, um, going in opposite directions uh, from the main structure, whereas uh, cis uh, um, uh, unsaturated fatty acids have those um, unsaturated uh, uh, hydrogen atoms sitting uh, in, in the same direction. So what we see uh, in practice is or what we what has been shown in in, in various studies, both interventional and uh, observational is a strong association of trans fatty acids um, with with heart disease risk and those are often found in highly processed uh, fats fats that undergo high temperature as you said um, can generate uh, these uh, trans fatty acids uh, from the way the oils are processed and that is I think generally agreed upon as an adverse effect which has led to changes in the food industry and the restaurant industry that have greatly limited uh, the amount of saturated fat that were trans saturated fat that we're exposed to, trans unsaturated fat that we're exposed to, um, even to the point of putting this in the um, food label um, and making uh, conclusions based on uh, whether they meet a certain criterion for having unmeasurable amounts of trans fat. That that's an important an, another important type of heterogeneity of fatty acids um, that could be uh, considered. Uh, in heart disease risk assessment. Having said that, believe it or not, there's even heterogeneity among um, the trans fatty acids. There's there's different forms of trans fatty acids, and not all of them necessarily have the same effect. So it really gets complicated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it, again, in terms of trying to simplify the categorization, uh, we have you know the sort of broad category of saturated fat. We have the broad category of monounsaturated fat, which is, for example, olive oil. We didn't talk about that. Canola oil is another one that has one of these uh, double bonds um, uh, in the structure. And then we have polyunsaturated fat. We have omega six, omega three. Then we have trans fat versus uh, versus the normal cis form, uh, and we have heterogeneity within each of those categories. So there we've got a full plate, if you will, of uh, characters in this game. Mm -hmm. um, in general, directionally speaking, in general, for the United States, how have um, how have dietary fat patterns of intake changed over time? Are we getting more polyunsaturated today than we used to? Or are we getting less saturated fat? What have been some of the major patterns there, say, over the last 100 years? Well, I, I don't have enough of a handle on that time span um, to give you uh, exact numbers. But I can tell you that one of the consequences, and we think it's due to the guideline process um, over the last uh, several decades, has been a reduction in the average consumption of saturated fat. And that, I, I can throw out some numbers, which I'm not going to stand behind because I don't have them uh, in front of me, uh, nor do I have the exact uh, figures, but uh, something in the range of you know, 14, 15% of calories of saturated fat was not uncommon uh, in the old days, and even higher uh, uh, in, in, in many cases. Um, the average consumption has now been reduced to something between 11 and 12%. Mm -hmm. um, saturated fat uh, intake has come down. And some people think that that's a beneficial consequence of the guidelines. And I can't argue against that. I mean, I think that may be part of the reason why cholesterol levels in the population are dropping somewhat uh, because of that. But it's a, but we'd expect it to be a relatively small effect, but it's in the right direction. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, we've had this corollary of reducing total fat and increasing carbohydrate uh, at the expense of fat. Um, and that that has changed. And I can't give you the exact numbers there, but um, uh, for example, um, just throwing some numbers out, which I can't be exactly sure of, um, you know, something like half of total calories, 50% or so or, or more, uh, were coming from carbohydrates uh, uh, or, or less, I should say. It started off uh, in the old days, and I don't know if it's 100 years or 80 years or whatever, but carbohydrate intake was maybe 45 to 50% um, in, in general. Um the guidelines push that up to 50 plus percent. So the guidelines push the carbohydrates in the other direction. Um, where we are now, I don't have the exact numbers, but um, we're, we're not at the 45% level. And, and for example, from a metabolic standpoint, my own studies uh, and those of others have suggested that we probably should go back to 45 or less as a target mm. um, to try to reduce some of the metabolic adverse effects of carbohydrates overall, because it's not just sugars, it's it's all of these processed carb carb starches and carbohydrates in particular that contribute to that um, 50 plus percent. And so I, I, so I haven't answered your question in detail, but it's, it's this general trend um, mm -hmm. that we think has resulted uh, in part, at least from uh, the dietary guidelines that have been promoted and the food industry's efforts to meet those uh, guidelines. Um. In one of the papers of yours that I looked at, and, and you kind of, you mentioned something earlier. I asked you about uh, the macronutrient comp macronutrient composition of your breakfast, I think. And you said you don't think about things in terms of, you know, hitting specific numbers for yourself. Um, and I know that you've written about something called the the food and diet matrix. So, so what is this? So um, that's considering uh, the effect of the foods um, as we actually eat them. Um, which contain these chemicals, they contain the fatty acids, they contain, you know, the sugars and, and starches, um, uh, but they are contained within what we call a food matrix. And I touched on one uh, uh, example of that in the case of fruits, um, uh, where we see that uh, the sugars in particular uh, can be embedded uh, in a food that has a lot of fiber uh, that uh, embraces the sugar and affects its metabolism. So that food context of a whole fruit versus a processed uh, juice, for example, is maybe an extreme example of uh, the um, food matrix affecting its metabolic effects. Uh, in the case of fats, um, there is studies which also point to the matrix as being important. Um, I mentioned the fermentation process, for example, which appears to uh, generate beneficial changes um, in, in carbohydrate quality um, that have been associated with cardiometabolic risk benefit. 
um, uh, but in, in the case of cheese, uh, that it's been shown, um, and this varies across different cheeses, of course, but in general, um, the same amount of saturated fat in cheese has a much smaller effect on LDL cholesterol than that uh, effect in, than the effect uh, of that same amount of saturated fat in butter. So mm. there's a few studies showing that saturated fat, uh, well, saturated fat may be equivalent across those two forms of dairy. Um, the context in which the saturated fat is consumed within cheese due to something about the matrix uh, appears to uh, change its, its, its metabolic impact and probably its effect on heart disease risk. Um, so, um, so that, that's the food matrix angle, which has really not been well enough studied in my view. Um, and certainly not enough to be able to point to ways of assessing that, um, analytically that could be translated to dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I would imagine in general here, just to help people think about it, right. If, if scientists study the effect of like an isolated macronutrient on the body, it may or may not have the same effect in the context of whole food A versus whole food B because there's just so many interacting pieces here that affect how each of each of the components is absorbed and used by the body. Is that basically it? No, uh, well, that's a, that's a big part of it, but that but it, there's two other things to consider. Um, one is uh, the effect of other components in that same food um, that could be uh, influencing the effects that have nothing to do with either the matrix or the nutrient of interest that's just sort of coming along for the ride. And um, particularly for plants, for example, there's just, I don't know, dozens or hundreds of what are called phytochemicals that are contained within fruits and vegetables that uh, we don't, we measure some, we can measure some of them, but we don't have specific evidence that one or another of those uh, nutrients has an effect. So that's kind of a second axis um, by which uh, uh, the food uh, context could uh, have a unexpected effect either good or bad that would not be predicted from a particular component of the food and then the third thing and the final thing um, that supports a concern about um food uh uh context is is not just the foods but the overall dietary pattern because um we can study individual foods perhaps um but what we really consume is uh is dietary patterns we consume foods with other foods we consume um classes of foods together uh, in some cases and not in others. Um, and so there's uh, the context, not just of the food matrix, but the overall dietary uh, pattern. So I'm glad to say that the guidelines advisory group, at least, uh, and I think the guidelines themselves have been, push, have been certainly in the last edition uh, and hopefully in the future editions, um, will emphasize the role of dietary patterns overall be, uh, that uh, exceed the information that we can get from trying to uh, put numbers around the individual uh, components and their percent of the diet. Uh, the overall dietary pattern should be uh, considered as a major goal. And there have been studies, for example, uh, involving what's called the Mediterranean dietary pattern, which itself has different versions depending on where you are in the Mediterranean uh, world. But um, uh, in th that program, which is, uh, again, a number of different dietary effects um, that go well beyond effects on cholesterol has been associated with, with improved heart disease risk as well as other metabolic benefits. Uh, and that's been promoted as um, one of the ways of achieving a healthful dietary pattern. Um, but again, we really would, would really benefit from having much more uh, data to support this um, and tell people exactly um, how they should be implementing these diets because um, uh, they don't always go to the literature and see uh, what other studies, we, what the studies we're using. Um, they need to get guidance that's much more specific, and we don't have enough uh, data yet in that direction to really document benefits. Well, Dr. Cross, we've uh, covered uh, quite a bit so far. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave people with about anything that we've talked about, the general subject of diet and metabolic and cardiovascular health? Okay, so um, one can step back, uh, maybe at the 20,000 foot level, if not the 30,000 foot level, and say that there are certain um, aspects of diet and cardiovascular health in particular that uh, I think we can stand behind based on evidence that I mentioned that is not always perfect, not always sufficient to show causality, but which is sufficiently compelling um, to generate um, uh, some healthful uh, overall dietary patterns. Um, 
and I mentioned the Mediterranean diet, but uh, within that diet, um, I think there is evidence to support um, overall uh, benefits. Uh, and again, not through mechanisms that we fully understand um, of uh, of a variety of uh, vegetables and fruits and plant-based uh, foods and healthy carbohydrate uh, foods that are not processed carbohydrates, that those um, plant-derived foods uh, should be and a variety of them should be consumed. Um, I think it goes beyond the cholesterol issue. It goes beyond um, being able to point to a specific component yet and say that's what you should be doing. Um, it's really related to uh, the overall dietary pattern. And that, I think, should be considered uh, uh, as a as a goal in one form or another uh, to, to try to achieve. Um, and I'll mention that one of, in our, one of our own studies where we looked at the effects of a dietary protein. We didn't talk about dietary protein. I'll just throw that in oh, since we didn't discuss that. Um, there's been issues regarding uh, is red meat uh, worse than white meat? Um, and how did that compare with non-meat sources? We actually did a study where we looked at not heart disease. Uh, it was not that kind of a study, but we looked at the LDL and other lipid levels. And we found that um, uh, if one consumed a non-meat protein as a major source of protein, um, uh, that there was a, a lower level of LDL than with either the meat, high meat, or the uh, the high white meat or the high red meat diet. I mean, from either mostly from fowl versus uh, beef uh, and other sources, um, their LDL levels were similar and higher than on the plant based diet. So um, that gives us uh, one other axis to think about, and that is um, uh, uh, the source of protein. Um, and uh, along those lines, uh, I should probably also come back to one other issue we talked about, and that is um, the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which, as I mentioned, are enriched in fatty fish such as salmon, certain uh, certain tunas, uh, sardines, uh, herring uh, are all rich in these long-chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, there's some evidence, and again, it's observational uh, evidence for the most part, uh, that has linked in high intake of those uh, sources of omega-3 with um, improved cardiometabolic and overall heart health um, that have not been necessarily reproduced by the fish oil themselves, not, not necessarily by the omega-3 component, but the food, this gets back in part of the food context uh, issue we just discussed. So I'm, I'm in favor, in addition to having this overall uh, balanced diet with plenty of plant-based uh, protein sources, um, uh, diets that uh, include um, at least a couple, one or two portions of fish a week uh, to provide um, whatever benefit that might provide, and then choosing carbohydrates that are uh, unprocessed. And I tell my patients that I consult that consult me. Um, again, I talked about my, my cereal, my fiber cereal, which um, is uh, has a very high fiber content. One should look at the label of foods and look at the fiber content, look at the, at the sugar content, uh, and limit the sugar and try to, in the case of these carbohydrates, maximize uh, the fiber. Um, uh, uh, intake. So, so those categories, I think, are major, major uh, uh, kind of bottom line dietary recommendations, which are you know more global, more general. Um, and um, what's been shown is if one follows dietary patterns like that, um, including even the Mediterranean diet, one can back generate the percent distribution of calories. So, so you can learn what are those diets giving us if you're if one's interested. And it turns out they pretty much conform to what we try to recommend. It's not having too much carbohydrate, uh, not having too much saturated fat for, for many people. Um, all of that sort of comes out um, in the end, but it's not necessarily the, the criteria. I don't think it should be the criterion, nor should it be considered the mechanism for benefit of those diets. Um, it's really a marker of intake. Um, but the real, the real effect of these diets is coming from the foods and the dietary patterns in which they're consumed. All right, Dr. Ronald Kraus, thank you for your time. Okay, great to talk to you. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen and it's a handheld pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. 
Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters, to get $50 off your Lumen device today.